If y'all don't know, we have a special guest today, Marcella Areca. Mm -hmm. Hope I sure hope I said that right. I you you know, said it perfect. To, all right, perfect. What's your What's your background, by the way? Are, is that uh, Are you Colombian, Brazilian? Uh, I'm Colombian, Nicaraguan. Okay, nice, I'm nice. Born and raised in Miami. All right. I'm from Colombia, my father's from Nicaragua. So, uh, Marcella Areca is is she's a, a for one, a fellow Full Sail alumni, so we definitely hey. got to give it up for that. Um, you know, you, you left just a little bit before me, man. I wish we might have been in the same uh, class when I was there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Marcella also goes by Miss Lago, right? So if you, we was going through this earlier, you know, you put that together, Marcella Lago, Marcia Lago, because she's like the, <laughs> the Lamborghini of audio engineers. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, she came up under Jimmy Douglas and has had a great career in the industry from working with everybody from uh chris brown jennifer lopez meek mill y clef snoop dogg mariah carey missy right uh got some tutelage from jimmy douglas in the earlier years as well uh so oh. definitely a uh, a fantastic person to uh speak with to to get to know to learn some stuff from and uh for one we just want to say uh welcome to the wavy seals elite Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Pleasure to be here. Yes, Great indeed. to see y'all. So I kind of want to start this off, like, you know, definitely like kind of getting to know even more about your like background, right? Like what, what sparked you in the first place to want to jump into music production and audio engineering? Um, I mean, what, what really sparked me was just music itself. I, I felt from a very young age, um, I would I would listen to music I feel like differently than than other people would. Um, I would be interested about like what was in the sound or how that sound happened. You know that was my thought process. So growing up, I I just had a a love for the making of music. Mm -hmm. And before I got into engineering, I thought that that is what my path was going to be. Was I wanted to make music and produce. Um, Early in my uh, my years, like starting in middle school, I thought also I wanted to perform. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll sing. That didn't work out too well because <laughs> because I'm sta I have a, I have like I had a severe stage fright problem. Like I would just freeze on stage. Like I never had that thing where artists say that they have the nerves, but once they get up on the stage, it all goes away and they just yeah. like they whatever all else they can just do it. <laughs> Not me. I just freeze and forget everything. So I knew that wasn't my path, um, but in like starting in high school, I started kind of hanging around that crowd of music makers, uh, like rappers, producers um, out here. And, you know, I started to kind of be around some of the equipment, like an MPC, um, the early uh, Dawes, like Cakewalk, <laughs> like, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, so like I said, like, I thought that that was going to be my path. Like, oh yeah, I want to make beats. I want to make beats. So you know, going out of high school, I was trying to find a school that could offer that to me. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I found Full Sail. And, you know, what I didn't know was, weirdly enough, right, when I would read credits on the back of, of CDs and cassettes and all that growing up, yeah. you'd always read like engineer, producer, artist, all the, you know, the credits on the background like when we did, did have those sleeves. Right. And I even though I would see engineer, I don't really, I don't think I really understood what that, what that, who that was, like what that person did. So when I went to Full Sail and I went to that behind the scenes things that they do, like before you go, you know, they're yeah, like, the you know, you come in here and learn how to engineer. And then when they walked us into the studio, I'm like, I remember it like hitting my head, like, wait, engineer, I'm like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so clueless, believe me or not. Like it was bad. And they were like, well, the person that runs the session records. And I was like, oh, okay. But I'm still thinking I want to be a producer. Like, I'm already, like, kind of in that world, like, making beats. Um, so when I started going to Full Sail, like, I just really fell in love with the, with just the sound of it all. Like, just understanding how it's all collected and captured and manipulated and all that. So, you know, I, I just easily, even though I started Full Sail not knowing anything I really immersed myself into the program to really understand it all. And as I started to understand it, it just was something that I wanted to pursue. And little by little, I started realizing that my beats were whack. 
So I was like, you know what? Like, I, ain't, I don't think I'm gonna make it here either. So, um, you know, like, and you start to figure out from full sale, like, all right, what am I going to do afterwards? You know, and working in a studio was going to be the, the, the path that I went down. Um, I couldn't go to a studio saying I wanted to be a producer, but I did know I wanted to learn more about engineering in the real world, which is where I found, um, I got the job at the hit factory right out of, right out of full sale. That's dope. Yo, I just want to say, like, I feel like we instantly connected because my story is so similar to that. Like, I was a rapper when I was growing up as a yeah. kid and all that. And I was good in the studio and everything. But when we had our first show, that's when I realized, like, I was like, nah, I can't do this. I'm standing outside with the bubble guts. I'm like, literally, yeah. like Eminem song. His arms are sweaty, knees, yeah, knees yeah. you know? mom spaghetti you know Yo. I, I really felt like that so <laughs> and, and so from then i was like you know i, I still want to be a part of this so yeah. I, I started digging more into the production side of things and i was using mm -hmm. uh sony acid like making loops in the sony yep. acid and um yeah and eventually i end up finding full sale uh, as well so like I'm, I'm, we we That's on a, crazy. a similar path like with that <laughs> that stage fright pushing us away That's pushing us to the back crazy yeah <laughs> it, it's crazy nowadays because so many people like see me from being like online and stuff and they think that i'm like this so so yeah you know what's person, but i'm so not the same thing like now that i go out and do so many speaking engagements they're like wow you're so natural at this and it's it is what i mean for me it is it's like it's cool i mean i love what i do yeah. you know but i'll never forget that other side of it was that was that that was no i was like no i'm yeah. not doing that for sure <laughs> so as for me like a part of like my youtube journey kind of getting into like putting these tutorials and stuff on youtube is because i i kind of felt that there was a, a lack of representation, um, you know, from like minorities in, in audio engineering, um, especially like in, in YouTube. Well, just like period, right? It's always kind of had this this certain look. I, I want to know like what kind of gave you the, the confidence that you could, you know, go forward with the audio engineering career? Well, like, was there any examples, anybody you looked up to that kind of, you know, put that, you know, that, uh, that instilled that into you? Um. So no, um, I did not have any men like like models to like look right. after, right? Like the I remember the only I'll say woman, right? Because I was kind of like when I was in full cell, you know how it was. Like I mean, when I was there in two thousand one, our class was only like four women, me included, and everybody right, out else of was like a hundred people or something. Yeah, right? out of like a hundred and something people. So <laughs> and then on top of that, you know, it wasn't so sensitive to for a man to say. Not a lot of women do this, so I don't know why you want to do this, right? Back then, I was being discouraged, right? Mm -hmm. But I just couldn't let go of what I loved, right? I just had a passion for it. I had a fire for 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 wanting to 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 do it and, and be a part of creating music in some way. You know, no matter what, since I was little, I wanted to be a part of of, of music making. Mm -hmm. So once I found the love of engineering, it was like I y'all could tell me anything and I was being told everything mm -hmm. from A to Z right to just really discourage me um I mean even like friends and family would be like man is it, are you sure this is what you want to do my own parents right like I'm uh first generation American like they came you know when I, I was born here like my older brother was born in Nicaragua I was born here in the states mm -hmm. so for them it was important that I had you know, proper college education. I followed the four years, you know, the very traditional route. Yeah. So for me to not go that route, my A, my parents were very supportive of me going to full sale. But once I finished, they were kind of like, all right, now what? Okay, well, now I got a job. But I, I was only getting paid like minimum wage. So they're like, well, you just paid all this money to go to this school, you know, and, and, and whatnot. But for me, it was, I didn't have those, those, those role models. I had, um, Linda Perry, I remember was being was the one woman out there that I was like, man, she's dope, you know, because she's like you would hear about her. You know, she was an artist. She was a songwriter. She was an engineer. She was a producer like she she kind of did everything. So it was kind of like that's who I, you know, was looking at from a distance. Like, man, I want to be like Linda Perry. Right. Like yeah. in some way or another, like she's just so cool. Like the way she, <laughs> she just is, too. Like, I just like her persona. Yeah. Um, but. I didn't have anybody like that, right? And and this is like pre what we are today where we didn't have the social medias. I didn't, you know, there was no YouTubes like that. Like 
we barely had um we don't, i don't even think we had the iphone yet i can't remember when it came out for a long time i had a blackberry but my point is like i didn't we didn't have things at our fingertips like we have today right yeah. and so i was sort of on my own um going through this journey with certain people that were in my corner you know men not because yeah. there weren't women at, yeah. yet in the beginning right there weren't women in the beginning that I had known. So there was a few um, guys that were working at the hip factory um, or that I had met in school that I'm still friends with today that really just stood in my corner and would be like, yo, you got this, like, you know what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I graduated full sale with the, the advanced recording engineering award. So there was a lot of just, you know, yeah. good uh, aura around me with getting, being, you know, wanting to be successful and potentially being successful, mm -hmm. but I had to do the work, you yeah. know, I had to do the, the, the I had to grind, um, you know, and do you feel like you had to work harder than like the, the male counterparts to make sure you proved yourself when you stepped in the room. I, I definitely feel like I had to, because I, there would be comments made like, you know, when I was at the hit factory, let's say like one of the Osbergers would blow. Right. So we'd have to change, you know, one of the, the 18 woofers out and it's like they'd be like well you know it's too heavy for you like you might not want to do that like you know just like silly things like that and i'd be like no i got it and <laughs> i would know how to and i would know how to like you know it's a very simple um repair to do yeah. um or at least assist the tech person in doing it but there'd be there'd be comments made so i always felt like i had to prove myself but i had no problem doing that i didn't want a, a pat on the back you know, like I didn't want any of that. Like I wanted to be in the trenches. Like I, I, I wanted to be very much, uh, you know, not treated differently at all. You know, I honestly did not understand. And to this day, I still kind of talk about this. I don't get the big deal on the gender, right? Because to me, at the end of the day, I was doing a job. Right. I wanted to be a great engineer. Like I didn't want to be the greatest female engineer or like, like, oh, that's the woman engineer. Like, I'm just, I'm an engineer. I'm a recording engineer. I'm a mixing engineer. And that's what I sought out to be. So when it was always being tagged with, oh man, she's a dope uh, woman engineer. Like, I'm just the engineer. Like, you know, right. <laughs> like, no one ever says like, oh man, that's a dope man engineer. Because everybody assumes like when you say engineer, it's a guy. I mean, I you know, it's, it's, same... it's reversed. Like if I was a nurse or something, they'd be like, yo, that's a good male nurse. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, there, 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 there's some instances not to take that. I see but... what you're saying, but we don't like, okay. So what the guy teacher, I don't know, but you know what I'm trying but to yes, say, right? Sometimes just because it is for no reason though. Right. It's not, there's just because of uh, like historically, you know what I mean? These certain jobs have been taken on by certain people, but it doesn't, there's no qualifications that would disqualify either or, you know? Yeah. Um, so I definitely get that. When you, <laughs> when you start working at the, uh, when you start working at the hit factory, um, did, how did you acquire that job? Like, how did, how did you get in there? Was it like full sale? Did they help you with the placement or did you go out and, you know, seek this place out? Um, so no, uh, full sale did not help me with this. I, about three months into my program, I started thinking about where I wanted to end up after my, you know, it was a one year back when I went, it was only a one year uh, program, Same two year here. degree in one year. Right. Yep. So I'm like, all right, I got nine months before I graduate. What am I going to do? So I started thinking ahead. Um, I started thinking, do I want to stay in Miami? Do I want to leave, you know, the, the nest and go to New York, go to LA? Kind of started thinking where all these like recording um, capitals, I guess, per se, where, where they would be at. Yep. Uh, what made more sense to me was just try to stay home. And, and if I was going to stay home, I was going to work in the best place ever. <laughs> so that was the hit factory. Okay. So I I started to reach out to the studio manager at my three month time and just started saying, hey, like, I want to um, I'm a student, uh, very interested to be a part of the team when I graduate. If, you know, if there's availability, if there's an opening, um, he kind of just brushed me off. I reached out again at six months. I reached out again at nine months. I asked for a tour at that time. And I was just like, hey, like, I would love to see if I can get a tour just to see the place. When I walked into the hip factory, it like, I was like, yo, I have to work here. <laughs> before that, like 
I would only I only knew about the history of it, but yeah. to actually be inside the building and see all the plaques and see the studios, it was five world class recording studios, like world class. Like they had three SSLs, mm. they had one Sony Oxford board, you know, and a Neve. Like it was yeah. just like everything. It was like you it was crazy. Of. So, um, yeah, right before I graduated, I reached out. I I. <laughs> I always laugh at this. I'm like, I, I sent in my resume. I don't even know what, like, because I'm like, what, but what's the resume really saying, right? It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I bagged groceries at Winn-Dixie prior to this. <laughs> it shows customer service, right? We there you the go. Right. Industry, That's right? true. That's yeah. true. But, you know, I, I handed my resume. Um, he told me he didn't have an opening. So I graduated full sale. And I was like, dang, I ain't got a job now, right? But I didn't put all my eggs in one basket either. I did reach out to other studios, but the Hit Factory was the eye on the prize. Yeah. Um, I even reached out to like an audio post studio in Miami that, you know, I was just like anything where I can just be on the computer. Um, but um, I, about two weeks after graduation, he did call me back and say, you know what? I do have an opening, come in for an interview. And I got there and thought I, I didn't think I did well in the interview. Um, Trevor was very intimidating, uh, the studio manager there. It was very intimidating. And so I was nervous. Like, you know, the, the Eminem song came on, you know, the palms were sweaty. Everything was just like, All that, oh my back God, again. like this is crazy. So I didn't think I got the job, but um, he ended up calling me and telling me that he was going to give me a shot. And I had to move from Orlando right in that weekend. And I started at Monday. So it was... Wow. That's quick awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah look I, I i love the the parallels um and i and i asked that question because like i feel like we all gotta like take control of our own like destiny right how to, yeah. how to get out there um you know going to full sale as well like i didn't i never waited on the the career placement people to to place me nowhere they was like putting people on cruise ships and stuff like that i'm like nah <laughs> i'm not trying to do that man so I, I i literally did the same thing you did um it's i would go up what? to i end up working in new york at quad as my first yeah and uh yeah i i would go up there when we had like little breaks instead of going back home in st louis uh, me and my roommate, we just go to New York, tour the studios, get to know the managers and stuff like that. Just like being proactive. Um, I think that was like the like really key, like because, you know, no, nobody's going to put you where you want to be except you. Uh, exactly. Yeah, no. And, and I think it was just important that I think, you know, when I went for that tour, um, you know, just putting a name face, you yeah. know, for the person that was reaching out for months at, at this point, I think may may have put my resume um, on the, you know, it's the Hit Factory. I'm sure he had a stack. Exactly. You know, and he and maybe that is what maybe put put it at the top. You know, I, I, you know, I always wonder. I never asked Trevor. <laughs> I should <laughs> ask him. <laughs> what you know, made look, you want to call look, me? Just speaking on resumes real quick, for anybody that's applying to a studio, I always try to tell you, don't make your resume boring. Like, you're not applying to to do nobody taxes, right? Like, do, right. Do, put some design on there. Yeah. Add a little flair if you can. Because, again, it is a whole stack. And the one that got the little thicker, better paper and, you know, got a nice letterhead and, and, and a, a special font or some kind Fact. of character to it that's the one that i'm gonna want to look at right yeah to see who's this person that put the extra time in versus the you know the word word document template that that you just got right exactly that's a great great point yeah yeah um i feel uh like when i was when i was when i was working at quad i was probably interning unpaid for almost two years um, and that included everything from, you know, uh, doing sessions as, you know, a second assistant to cleaning yeah. the bathrooms. It was even a time when they remodeled the studio and, and I was taking, literally walking down 42nd street and taking gear and other stuff down to the studio owner's house. Like he, he used to live down in, uh, like hell's kitchen. And so we would walk down from midtown to, to hell's kitchen and, and, and take stuff to his house, man. We, we was doing all kinds of stuff. We shouldn't have been doing as interns, but <laughs> I, I say that to say, like, what was your internship experience like? And would you recommend that path still for somebody looking to uh, get into audio engineering today? Um, so my my path was, I mean, basically, as a general assistant at the Hit Factory, I, I in the beginning, I was not in the studio at all. I was 
running food. I was making beautiful little flower arrangements, fruit baskets, blowing the leaves in the parking lot, yeah. um, destroying the cable closet and then redoing it just so I can look like I was busy because sometimes <laughs> there was nothing to do. But the, 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 the worst thing that could have happened is if the studio manager caught you doing nothing. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So if there was everything that was done, it was like, what do I do? So I go in the cable closet and I would just like kind of undo a couple cables. And, I, and then I would also like practice how to, you know, like my cable yeah. skills and whatnot. Like I started, I, I mean, now like I'm ill. Like if there was ever a race on how to do it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know like, what? At the next mix, mix Nick, we having a cable wrapping competition. I'm telling you, because some Let's people, go. like, I'd be like, you'll be, you'll see. If I'm, <laughs> I can be there, yeah. I'm joining that. No, but, Matt, please, we um, need you on there. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it was, you know, like it was literally not, like I was not in the studio at all. And um, it was so weird because my journey as a general assistant changed after two months of, of being hired. Um, it just so happened I was the morning assist, a general assistant. Or it's basically an intern. It's just a fancier way of saying intern. Um, I was the morning general assistant that day and the uh, student manager got a phone call from uh, Missy Elliott, her team, saying that she wanted to come in. Missy lived about 15, less than 15 minutes away from the hit factory yeah. at the time. So she would just be like, Yo, I'm, Missy wants to come in today. And then Trevor would be like, all right, what time? And then they'd be like, in 15 minutes. So he didn't have anybody. He didn't have any assistants around. Yeah. Uh, the other assistants were already like on other sessions, but he couldn't call somebody that quick to show up. So he called me to the office and basically just asked me if I was ready. And I didn't even know what I was being asked it just because that's all he asked me was I was ready and so I just remember saying to myself like say yes and then I was just like yeah I'm ready yeah. I'm like what's up what do you need <laughs> like and then he just told me like I need you to assist um this session today because I don't have anybody to to call in this quick Missy will be here can you set everything up and I was like yeah there he's like you know her engineer will be here soon but just have everything set up get the mic you know things that the assistants will do yeah and I did that and Missy came in, the session went off without a hitch and um, her team called Trevor and was like, yo, like she, she's like, Missy loves her. Like she wants her on the sessions from here on out. So what is Trevor to do? Because he's like, well, like she's not really an assistant, but hey. if like the number one client is asking for her, like I can't deny her. Exactly. So he was just like, all right. So he gave me the the scenario and he's like, well, you know, you think you can do this? And I was like, absolutely. So I started to do both jobs. I was still the intern. I would, I would you know, open the studio at 7 a.m. And then when she would come in around 12, 1 p.m., I would I would transfer into being the assistant in the session. Um, and, and that's, you know, I was in the general assisting role for a while, a while, even, but still assisting at the same time. Yeah. So I was kind of working quite a bit around the clock because she would work from like noon to 4 a.m. And then I would come in at like, you know, my my shift would start at 7 a.m. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my my I didn't do like the two years without the pay. Like I told you, like I did have a minimum wage, um, you know, salary or not salary, but, you know, hourly okay. thing okay. going. Um, but I wasn't getting paid any different because I was an assistant. <laughs> I was right, still right. getting oh, paid you, like you, an intern. You know, like there was no extra uh, finances coming my way, but I didn't care. I wanted the I wanted the experience. And to me, that was way more valuable monetarily um, than any any actual monetary value at that time. Um, would I suggest it? Um, I mean, I, to be honest, there's 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 a gem in and really knowing the ins and outs of this business from the bottom up. So I honestly, like, I, I don't think it's for everybody. I don't think it's a cookie cutter. Like, yeah, everybody should get an intern job. I, I you know, to me it would be, it, I would suggest it to somebody that A, is not the most comfortable and, and, and knowledgeable in the studio. And really, if they really want to know the studio world and, 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 and how things run, then start from the bottom. But if you if you have a little bit more of experience and and you you know you you can bring something to the table, you know maybe that's not the way that you should go. Maybe there's another route. But then again, 
being like being in that position really allows you to to be in front of people that you don't even think you'll ever be in front of. Exactly. So there's value to it. The thing is, it's so hard today right. to, to for people to understand that because they're like, what? But we like, all pay, I want to do is clean yeah, toilet. Like, <laughs> yeah, they don't want to do that. I get um, when I do new hires, people ask me, like, when do you think I'll start mixing? In the interview, like, all right, like, and, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> It's like mind blowing to me because that was never on my mind. Never. You know, like for me, it was just like let, like, like step. You know, like let me take it step by step. Yeah. Um. So I, I just I trust. find it I find so much value in that. You yeah. know. And no, I and that, I totally agree. I think that yeah. a lot of the value is just being in the room, right? Just being like, in the room is a, crazy. A, they called it a, a second assistant, and literally, you were just the. The second assistant, you were the, the runner, basically, but you got, yeah. to, you got to sit in the room. But if they yeah. needed something, you can you had to go out and get it and bring it back. But, like, being in that room, like, you you watching people, like, that's making hit records that you would never get to watch. And so, like, for me, like, I'm, I still have a hard time even thinking of other ways. Like, how would somebody nowadays who, like, learned on their own maybe or, like, not wanting to get an internship, how would you get in contact with, like, the big artists? Like, how are you going to – how are you going to ever record or mix for them if, if you don't, you know, if they don't know you? If you don't they have don't a personal know relationship and you're not at the facility where they're at, like, how would they ever meet you? Yeah, because it's not going to happen, like, at their show. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to take your card. They're not going to listen to you. Huh, they're going to be like – Yeah. It, you so know, the only way life. is when it's, like, a personal – yeah. you know, in that, in that, in that very like personal environment. Yeah. So I still recommend like, look, if you want to, if your goal is to work with some of the biggest artists, like you yeah. got to go where they at. Right. Like I, you have to go where they at. So if yeah. you're not there, you have then, to be um, comfortable with what that, that entails. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to take a lot. So you, two things that, that helped you, I, I, from what I hear is that a, you were available, right? Like you were there, you were at the studio and you were willing um, but also you were prepared, right? And when um, the, the manager asked you if you were ready, you're like, yeah, I was ready. I'm ready. You weren't necessarily sure what you were ready for, but you, <laughs> you, you're you like, yeah, I'm ready. And it turned out that you were ready, right? Yeah. What, you know, what what at maybe Full Sail or in your earlier, like, training and stuff, what what do you, what would you kind of point to the most that, that made you the most ready, that, that gave you that, you know, said, like, because of this, I was ready? I mean, for me, I, I always remained, even after Full Sail, and even today, like, I stayed, a, I stayed a student of the craft, right? Like, I always, after I graduated Full Sail, it wasn't like, oh, I got my degree, I'm good. No, I would, I would literally still be in my books. Like, I would still be very, I wanted to, like, be knowledgeable. And I felt comfortable that if something came my way, I would be able to know what to do. And if I didn't, I wasn't afraid to ask the question or ask for the help from like a tech or a fellow assistant in right. the studio, you know? Um, I, I, I just, I was confident that everybody that comes into this business can't know it all. So we have to learn from each other. Now, I did get a lot of, some. there was some bad actors at the, at the studio that didn't want to see, see me succeed. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that became, you know, a little challenging at times. Like if I didn't have, some of my allies working that night, you know, I was like, oh my God, I got to go ask this guy, this guy, you know, knowing how he's just a jerk about everything, you know, that entails me. Um, but I honestly, like it, it, it was, I can't tell you that I, I wasn't afraid, but I'm not, I, I, I'm always up for challenges, you know, like I'm, I'm never, I'm one thing with me is I'm not afraid to make a mistake because I know that mistake is going to turn into a lesson um and and if i make a mistake okay like i you know i i try to be very easy on myself and say okay let's learn from this you know and 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 how can i be better next time and and i carry that with me to this present day and anything i do in life i have a 10 year old son i try to instill that same thing with him like you know when he thinks he's messed up he's he thinks it's the end of the world and i'm like hey relax you know it's like yeah. messing up is part of being human like we're we're going to mess up that's just part of it you yeah. can't be afraid you know and truth be told like the whole lago thing i mean i know I've, this story has been told a million times but the reason why lago came up was because i messed up mm -hmm. because the very first time i recorded missy 
I was slow. I was so slow at Pro Tools. I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to fly a hook in slip mode. Like I was playing back the record. The thing was coming in too early. Like she was cussing me out. Like <laughs> yo, she kicked me out the room and everything. And then, wow. and then, you know, I thought I had really messed up that relationship. And so what I took from that was like, yo, I'm gonna learn the heck out of this Pro Tools. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn all these quick keys. I'm gonna learn this thing. So I, I did not stop. Right. I was working on like, you know, I would come in early and just be on the computer, just learning it. I would work on a friend's rig that, that, that was, you know, that lived close by. Yeah. I mean, I literally, if I wasn't working, I was on Pro Tools, Pro Tools, Pro Tools, Pro Tools. So then maybe it was a few months later, um, she needed her engineer wasn't there and she needed to record. And I was like, well, I can, I was like, I, I got you. And she was like, mm -mm, no, ma'am, you ain't doing <laughs> you're recording me. And I said, no, just trust me. I think I got this. Like I got you. And so she let me record her. Mm -hmm. It was a day. It was, it was such a contrast from what had happened the first time to, to this present moment happening. I'm recording her. I'm, throwing effects in real time. I'm flying hooks as she's recording. Like there's, I don't need to stop. Like I'm just going in it. So then she ended up being like, call it, say, she was just like, damn, you went from like a turtle to a Marcielago. Like, and then that's kind of where the whole Lago thing came up was because it was my skills in Pro Tools that, that just became, you know, such a vast difference from yeah. the first time. And mind you, the first time I knew I was getting in that chair knowing I wasn't, I wasn't good. So I was <laughs> like, I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I think I, I've seen it enough. Like I can figure it out. But that slip mode caught me off guard. And that was enough to like, for her to just get this, this just upset with me to kick me out the room. But you, you know go. what I mean? Like I say, I, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm okay with taking chances. I'm okay with challenging myself and I'm okay with, making mistakes. Now, what I'm not okay with is making the same mistake twice. You know what I mean? So that I was not going to have her catch me on ever again. And she did not So, you know, it was th that moment from there on, like I started doing more recordings with her, eventually meeting Timberland, yeah. Jimmy Douglas, the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> So definitely. So we are some, I'm going to sum that up into learn Pro Tools and get really good at Pro Tools. So when you sit in the seat, you ready to, you ready. Be ready. To That's the thing you got to, <clears throat> listen, you got to be ready. Cause yeah. there was like so many times, so many times, like I'd be in the studio with like Timberland and you know, he's Timberland. So people would just show up, right? Like it wasn't right. even like a scheduled session. So you get like Jay-Z walking to the door yeah. and he just want to come in and hear beats. And then all of a sudden he love a beat and how he want to record it right away. And you know, the engineer is not around. So it's like, yo, can you do this? Like, and you can't be like, oh, you, no, I can't. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> I got you. Let's go. Like, you know, exactly. like you got to, you can't be the the reason why the, the creative flow isn't happening. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's something that I learned very early on is just like, you know, just let it flow. Make sure you're not like making it stop. Like, you know, yeah. and just make sure that things is always flowing. And, and that was like an important lesson that I learned very early on, not only from my own mistake, but just watching my peers and how they ran sessions like they like there could be issues happening and they would still be running a session flawlessly right. you know the show must go on right? the show must go on and i'm over here in the back as the assistant trying to fix the issue you know like yeah so because it was our job as the assistant to make sure that our, the engineer looks good right yeah and have their back 100 yep. percent. that was our sole job like, <laughs> yes. it, like yo make sure i look good <laughs> yes so um, a, a lot has like changed, you know, in the industry since you started, I know, like, you know, from the business aspect to the way that music is made, like all together, like, where do you, how do you think, like, like, where do you think the future is going? You know, everybody, it was the, a moment of big studios. You probably was ju jumping in right at the tail end of it, like kind of as was I, you probably had a little more time there. But like when I started getting in the quad, like it was like starting to be the decline of the, of the big, you know, uh, studios, right? And and a lot of people start recording at home studios. Like, how did, did did that ever affect your work at all, or did you kind of feel any of that? I, I weirdly enough, I did not feel that. Mm. Um, you know, I stayed at the Hit Factory for for a few years before I went out on my own as a freelancer. 
And once I started going out on my own as a freelancer, I was working at all the major studios around the country, you know, in Atlanta and Vegas and LA and New York. I know like I've worked in New York. Like I, I hated what happened to New York in the studios because that broke my heart. My favorite place to work was New York. I worked a lot out of the Sony studios um, that was across the street from the Hit Factory. I never even worked in the Hit Factory in New York, weirdly enough. But I did work um, at Sony. I did work at the Germano Studios. I worked at uh, Electric Lady, obviously Puff's studio and stuff like that. But um, I just, I, 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 I could, I could hear. I, I would know what was happening in the background, but like, I was luckily like still working at such a heavy, like a high level that I was always working at big studios, like. Right. You know, um, I, rem I remember the in. first time I worked in a home studio, it was with Britney Spears. I went to her house studio in Malibu. Oh, gotcha. And I remember being like, well, this is different. Like I was on a duality, <laughs> but it was still like a high end studio because it was a duality in there. But it was right. like home studio, it was, yeah. you know, it wasn't like it was a laptop a studio <laughs> in a home. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was like to me what it was, because I was always like working at such a you know, I, all the record labels were paying for, for me to work out of the big studios. Yeah. And then eventually, um, you know, I lived in L.A. for a few years. And when I made uh, Danger and I, we decided to build a studio here in Miami yeah. 10 years ago that we opened the doors. So we went from working on all these major studios into working into our hours, mm. which is still you know, yep. built to yep. be world class, oh, you know, right. so it's a, it's a, I saw some pictures online. It's a beautiful spot. And, Thank I, you. and I heard you say you opening it up to the public soon. Maybe we're going to have an a opening party or something like that. I, yes, I will be having it. I'll definitely be announcing that. But yeah, it's going to be um, open for, for public business. <laughs> I, so I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Britney Spears. And I was looking at your, your extensive resume now, because now, you know, I don't know what resume you gave the Hit Factory back then, but now you know, we can roll it out on a scroll, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I was looking at that and I saw Britney Spears and one thing that, that poked out to me was this song Womanizer, right? Mm. Now that's the Womanizer song um, for me, like I think it was like 2008, I'm in quad and me and the, one of the studio managers, Jason, like we were like sitting in the in uh, like the A room on the SSL when we just listening and we were just marveling at the mix on that record the production like that everything about that song was crazy and it became one of my my go-to like reference tracks for like a banging kick and a fat uh synthesizer synthesizer sound like i do i still love that record to the to this day that's one of my favorite britney spears yeah. songs i don't know the energy is crazy i just wonder like what what how was it like working with britney and like what was like your particular part on on that song uh, that you did just because I love that song so much. <laughs> so with Womanizer, I ended up recording all her all, all her lead vocals. Hmm. Like I wasn't a part. Um, so after the Blackout album, I think that one was the was that Circus? I can't I remember. I think what that was that Circus. Was. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I um I forgot what we did a couple records with her on that album. Mm -hmm. Um. But then I was called in from her A and R Teresa. Like we need to recut all of Britney's vocals, lead vocals. Okay. Like, can you come in? So it was like one of those quick calls. I came right in, and I already had a relationship with Britney because we did the entire Blackout album. Yep. Um, and that was the thing with Britney, was, you know, like you couldn't just call anybody. She had to be comfortable with you. So Teresa knew, like, I had this. We actually, we actually had a good friendship. Like, you know, um, it was a little hard to be. Uh, I guess, grow a friendship with her because she had a lot of people in her life that really controlled things, you know? Yeah. But when we would work together, we'd have the best time. So I, I think, you know, she, I, I don't know for sure if she was like, oh, call Marcella, you know, or, or if Teresa was just like, like, I, I need to call Marcella for this because she's, they didn't like whatever take that she did on her vocals. So they're like, they loved the recordings that I did on Blackout. Yeah. And they wanted that same energy brought in on that record. So I did the, yeah, I recorded that one. Um, but working with her, she's, she's, she's a doll. Like she's just such a nice person, yeah. you know, just a, a little a Southern little country girl, like, you know, that just caught, got caught up in the world of pop politics and yeah. the music business. And, you know, um, I hate seeing the things that have happened to her because to her core 
like she, as a person she's she's amazing you know and and she loves to do what she does like you know uh, she loves to perform she loves to sing you know however people want to judge she loves it she loves being behind a mic um and she, and if she really loves the record like she's going to work her ass off on it you know and and that's how we were able to do an album um as iconic as blackout was because And mind you, we did Blackout during some of her darkest times. Yeah. That's when she was really going through it, you know, shaved the head and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but the studio was her refuge. So whenever she, we got her in the studio, it was like nothing but 110% of, of work ethic, nice. which is all we can ask for as engineers, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like... I, my cousin was going to ask, like, when you when you're working with artists that are at that high, like at the highest level, do you find that there's a reason that they're there a lot of times? Like, yo, once you see their work ethic and how they grind and create, um, do you like is it more often than not? You'd be like, yo, I get it. I get it for you. You know, what I mean, I see why you why you are where you are. Or are there sometimes some surprises like, I don't know how you made it. You know, I was just going to say it's kind of the opposite. <laughs> sometimes I'd be like, yeah. man. Like you really pull the wool over the world's eyes because this is terrible, you know. Like yeah. I get artists that um, don't want to; they don't care. Like ah, oh, fix it in Melodyne, or like they don't care. They don't care about the performance. Like, yeah. and it's just like it's awful, you know what I mean? So yeah, like when it comes to an, an artist where people are like, man, but she, like her singing or whatever, and it's like yeah, but you know what? Like I'd rather take somebody that can't sing but works their ass off than somebody that can sing but doesn't care. Right. You know what I mean? Because then you're not really you're you're taking like you're 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 not taking the craft seriously, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 that's why when you meet artists like Beyonce, who does both, like her work ethic is, you know, at the top of the top, and then she can sing, yeah. and it's just like it's. I mean, she's incredible, you know. And then and then her core, she's beautiful human being. It's like wow, you know what I mean? She you were just destined for this, like, <laughs> you know. But no, there's a lot of artists out there that are just really getting by yeah. a lot you a know lot. and and it's um it's it's they're they're able to they're they're marketable so they're you know what i mean and and they're able to to get away with trash because they know that there's dollars behind them so mm. yeah it's just the nature of business and and the more we've gotten into these home studios and the, you know <laughs> where people don't want to pay for these big studios anymore it's even it's even mm. worse Even yeah, more. man, because I like I've I've gotten some stuff from some of like some of the biggest artists, you know, there are, and they are like in their home studio. I'm like, dude, do you have a microphone backwards or or something? Like, I don't know what's going on over there. You got mm -hmm. the dog barking. They're just like, yeah, mix yep. that. I'm like, no, I can't, I can't mix that. Oh, and, th and the thing is, the funny thing is, is artists now know the tools that we have, so they be, well, don't you got something that can take out that background noise? Yeah, they and they refuse to cut it over. I'm like, yo, <laughs> can you please just cut this over? And they're like, no. I'm like, bro, like you so, don't really do this to me. <laughs> yeah, no, listen, it's it's crazy. But um, you know, speaking on Britney too, when I was telling you, so, like, you know, a lot of that Blackout album too, like, you know, I was telling you she was going through a lot during that time. So, a lot of those backgrounds, you know, uh, Carrie Hilson was on them. Yeah. You know, just really kind of making it what it should have been. So, shout out to Carrie because. She really brought a lot of that music and, and, you know, just that vocal ability out. And it wasn't like she was trying to be like a Britney. It just really brought a different tone to the record, which I think added a layer that people, you know, it, it, and it wasn't like it was so in your face. It was just sort of like felt more than heard. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's like sometimes you just got to deal with with what you have. Like there was I can't remember the exact record, but. I even had to do some stuff like with my voice and try to mimic her wow. and then throw it into some crazy vortex of plugins to like really match it hmm. for her. You know what I mean? Like it, but That's it's, <laughs> I never, cause I never thought of that. Like I've had to get in and get surgical and take parts of a, a performance or even go to another session that I had and like find a similar word and kind of match it up. But Hmm, kind of jumping on the mic yourself and just kind of see, yeah, see if they don't I'm notice that I spit this bar over. Yelling it like that, that that was a, you know, like I, it was just for us to get that record done and we couldn't get Britney in the studio after a certain time because there was yeah. things that she was dealing with. It was like, well, let's like, we're going to deliver this, you know, and 
And um, I, I mean, I had a lot of fun doing it. Danger was around. Like, we just did what we had to do, you know? <laughs> it was just like, let's just get this record out. Not knowing the success and, and, the, and the notoriety that it would get. Like, we knew it was dope. Yeah. But we're always like that, right? It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> How many things have you thought it was amazing? Go, it goes out and it's like, it falls flat. Right. But it was like, for that, like, that was one of our first records that we put out. Like, for Danger and I? Yeah. yeah. Outside of the Shock Value one, the Nelly Furtado stuff that we did, and the, he, he did the um, Future Sex Love Sound with Justin Timberlake. Yes. That was like our one of our first like all right this is just Danger and Lago mm. doing this like outside of Timberland type production right and for it to be what it was was pretty mind blowing that's dope you know yeah, yeah. it sounds like you had a lot of memorable uh, experiences in the studio creating recording mixing like what is is there any one that you would say you know, or even just even one moment that you're like, all right, everything clicked. This is like a defining moment for me. Like, and and when you had that, did they, have you ever had a moment like that? Can you, or can you point to one specific? Uh, I don't know. I will say, like, I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was in the studio with Timberland. I was still a, I was still a um assistant at the time. I was still working for the Hit Factory, but I was an assistant at this point. And I finally got like, you know, promoted. I was a full-time assistant at this point. <laughs> and I remember like I, I was uh just sitting there and then like when Jay Z was there and he wanted to he, he want he heard the um dirt off your shoulders beat. Like, you know what I mean? And having that moment and I remember just being in the room. Are you in the room? Because it's a it's a famous clip about when when uh, Jay uh, that, oh, that clip. girl like I, you don't see my face. I have actually photos of it. Yeah, that's I, crazy. Have to post it. I have to post this one of these days. Yeah, that's an iconic moment right there. Yeah, that is an iconic. But but so yeah, but like the, if you you'll see a girl, she's looking like she's documenting things. That's me. But my hair was blonde then, and it was curly. Got you. But, it's the only girl in the, in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But no, I remember being in that studio, and I said, "Man, like, I think I'm going. I think I think I made. <laughs> like, I think I'm going places." Like, <laughs> Jay Z, I love Jay Z. Like, and then yeah. and then like I love Timberland, and like you know, I had already worked with Miss. So it was kind of like a lot of things were just aligning, and I was like, "This yeah. is crazy," you yeah. know. And, and and Jimmy was the engineer, so it's like I have my you know my mentor there like somebody that i just looked up to and i wanted to learn from so it was just like man like i definitely want to like i know like this is meant to be because a lot of times like you know even though like i'm i'm confident there's a lot of self-doubt that kicks in you know yeah. a lot of self-doubt and i'm like man, am i doing like you know what i mean like yeah 100%. i can't recall at this moment how long i had been working at the hit factory it had to be a couple years at this point but it was just like, what am I doing? Like, what is what is my end game here? You know, it's like, yeah. it, it felt like for me to sit permanently in an engineer chair mm. was like not it was like light years away. Like, I was like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I it just you know what I mean. But in in re, in in reality, it wasn't. It was maybe a few months later, but that was getting in my head. Yeah. Also, I started to be like, or I was like, you know, am I the, like I don't know. Like, you know, it's just a lot of things just start kicking in your head. Um, like, I, I want to know, like, what, what were you telling yourself that, that to like fight that off? Like what kind of internal dialogue were you having to, to stay in that moment? Because I know like when you say the self doubt, like for me, it comes every time I, I send a client a mix and I'm waiting on them to reply on the email. I'm like, if they take too long, I'm like, man, I suck. They hate it. Like, you no, know? Wait, I, can I tell you something? It still yeah. happens today. I've been doing this for 20 something years. Yeah. It still happens today. Like, it's just. I don't know. Like I, I, I start envisioning things like, oh my gosh, are they like scrunching their face up at the speaker? Like what the fuck? Is, like what is it? <laughs> exactly. Okay. They probably but, talk about me in a group chat. Yeah. Right and then start playing it back again, like on my own. Like no, no, no. This is this is good. Like you know, like. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, like in the beginning, like let me say, in the beginning, it would be Young Lago was more like. You love you love this like like if you, like I would ask myself I literally would look at myself in the mirror like there was times that like I wanted to like just flat out just leave like out the studio and quit and I would go to the bathroom and I would have a moment with myself and I'd look at myself and just literally have the conversation like 
do you want this? Do you love this? Do you, you know, like, can do you like those kind of questions and everything would come back. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Like there was no doubt. So I'm like, all right, well, there's you know, no doubt. Get back out there. And you know what I mean? Just keep, keep going. Like you can't stop. So it was simple as that. And then in today's world, and fast forward to today, where I still deal with like self doubt, well, you know, it's just like, like you said, waiting for the client to respond. It's still, it's, it's just like, I know, honestly, like I know I'm dope. I know yeah. I'm, dope. I'm dope. I may not be everybody's cup of tea and that's yeah. okay. That's fine. Right. Because like, I, I know the I mix differently than my friend um, Josh Goodwin mixes and the way uh, Leslie Brathwaite mixes and you know, everybody has their their style, their their unique ID to what sound is. So I'm OK with that. You know what I mean? I'm OK with. If somebody wants to go a different direction, it's not because it's a bad mix, it's because they're looking for a different direction. Like it's, You know what I mean? So I. I luckily have not had those issues, <laughs> but it gets in my head and I don't understand after 20 years, 20 plus years, like, yeah. I don't, I, is this like a forever thing? Yeah. But you know what's crazy? Because uh, Jimmy Douglas, like sometimes I have, I, I talk to him and he'll be like, he'll, like he goes through it too. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a man that's been doing this since the seventies. Like he's like, oh, I haven't heard back from the client. Guess they don't like it. <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> hey, look, man, look, if they don't like it, tell them to check their ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, he's an icon, he's a legend. Like, come exactly. on, like, like, you can't tell me Jimmy ain't dope. Jimmy put out <laughs> the most iconic records of our time and beyond, yeah. you know. So it's like, I don't know, it's always like a laugh, you know, it's always like, uh, yeah, like, I, I wonder Jimmy if a couple of times, the same thing. he says, always mad humble. Like, you know, I feel like that's just, that's a lot of that is his, his personality to kind of have that, that humility about him, you know, yeah. even though he, he has done so many amazing things. Yeah. But I, I was just saying, like, I wonder if like people outside of our profession, like let's say a doctor and they have to go in and deliver a baby. Do they go in like. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope the doctor ain't like that. He's like, yeah, we got to do this heart surgery. Like a neurosurgeon. But like, think about it. Like, anything can go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, no, you absolutely right. Because you know what, what we do, though. You know, we we care about it a lot. You know, and, we and a do. lot of it is, is tied into our like our identities and our personality. And so, like, you know, if we we want to do good. You know, we want people to like our work. And so, when they with if they don't, then we sometimes. I take it as a personal attack. No, <laughs> no, but it can feel that way sometimes. But yeah, uh, I'm glad that I'm not alone in uh, in those yeah, feelings. You're not alone. <laughs> um, just shifting gears here a little bit. Um, you know, I just kind of want to talk about the business of of audio engineering a little bit, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, traditionally as audio engineers, we get paid hourly, right? And then, um, or mix engineers, you get paid the one-time fee for the mix. Once the session is over, most uh, most times, unless you're like established um, and, and requested some points or something like that, then you don't get any residual income off of that. Um, I I think engineers should, you know, kind of get royalties on on records. Like, you know, a lot of a lot of times we we're doing production, you know, work in on those records, whether we're recording or mixing. Like, I kind of just want to get your your kind of take on that, your stance on that. Um, what has been your experience with um, getting royalties and 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 back in on records and stuff like that? Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think engineers should definitely partake in 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 royalties or even publishing if if, if yeah. You know, if you've done stuff on on the production level, things like a producer, they're receiving it right. The why why are we being excluded completely? Like, right. you know, and and you said like unless you're at a certain caliber, are you able to ask or just automatically given the you know the the points? You know, um, but in my career, I've I've you know i've been lucky enough to be able to receive um publishing on stuff that i've worked on but that's only because the producers have agreed to give me a part of their publishing right. you know what i mean like artists are never going to give it up for you you know or writers are not going to give it up but like if you have a you know a good relationship with a producer or if a producer knows what you bring to the table yeah. you know a big part of of the success of a record is the sound so i don't understand 
why you know and and uh, engineers we're, we're just sort of looked at as like throwaway you know it's like oh thanks for the job have a nice day you know it's like it's like like you know it's like goodbye you know yeah we're never thought about thought about again and we're and, and engineers were such an integral part of of music making yeah you know um so i i definitely feel like if you know publishing okay i get it we you know but definitely on the royalty side of things something i you know something needs to change you know um but again like if you're working with a, a client like if you're let's say you're i don't know kendrick lamar's engineer it's like and you're with him for years i feel like it's a natural step to go in that direction you know Right. what i mean um if you're being called to just come in and do hey i need an engineer for the night to come record this that's different right like that's sort of like you're it's just you're doing the job you're getting paid you're moving on but if you're a part of the record making like we're on an album and we're all doing this together producers writers artists musicians engineers and you know musicians get shunned too though you know like if a musician comes in it's like they just get their fee and they move on but they you know unless you do a, a certain part of the record and somebody says oh hey like i want to give you a point or half a point or whatever it, it it's just the the fact that we're not even in the conversation is just something that needs to change it does need to change because um but it's, it's like i said it's hard because how do you how do you implement that right like if you're just getting called for like a session like you know and you're not a part of the whole thing maybe the engineer the main engineer is sick for two days so you're just right coming in to substitute like so whatever you know songs that i got on <laughs> whatever songs i worked on but no there really needs to be some type of standardization i don't know if we need to get some new laws in place or something I think that we do. that I think I think includes it's people us like you and I that need to really protect the future generation of engineers, right? Because it's it, it's an um it's an ideology that has been completely ignored and whenever it is brought up, we're like it's like we're we get the side eye and it's like why are y'all giving us the side eye? I'm giving y'all the side eye back. Cuz it's like, you know, like we've been we're we're here. If anything, we're the first ones there and the last ones gone. Like what's up? <laughs> like, Yeah, exactly. you know? Yeah, yeah, Oh, you know I mean? and 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 we're the last ones to touch the records before I don't master. So before the very last bit before it goes to mastering, Yeah. it goes, you know, out of my hands to mastering and then it goes off from there. To But the world, yeah. um, you know, and, and then the other side of it too, it's like there's such a big responsibility in what we have to do with file management. Like it's not just like we're recording and calling it a day. It's like there's a lot. of 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 that that entails the work that goes beyond just the hourly or the the day rate you know i i definitely do think that if there's an uh, album if you're a part of an album making you should be a part of of you know eating off that album for the rest of the success of the album you know Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about union unionization as um like audio engineers? Like do you, like do you think like studio workers should form some union or something like that? Um because there's also like a huge Like there's huge gaps in, in what people are getting paid, like astronomical Yeah. gaps on what, you know what I mean? One mixer is getting from a, from another mixer. Um, I yeah, no, I agree. I, I definitely I, I would be in agreement to that because it's such it's 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 like a wild, wild west out here. Like anybody are, can ask for anything, um, whether you're of that value or not. Um, it's like I get I've had in the last few months, I've had engineers that have had to call here to work that I've never worked with them, but I needed somebody to come in and record for whoever was coming in and they they would you know give me their rate and i'm like all right well okay i guess you know. <laughs> if that's what you want like yeah, all right cool and then i get the call like yo we need another engineer like this person's whack like killing the vibe tomorrow we need another somebody you know so i'm like yeah i'm wondering like why are you how did you even come up with that rate like if you're not even able to hold down the session right when i ask like in detail like what what you know what went down it's literally somebody that did not know how to carry a session like they didn't even know how like a problem would happen and they wouldn't even know how to problem solve it Right. so it's like uh it's a it's a it's a rough time right now too because there's a lot of you know like there's so many more 
engineers today than there was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I always make this joke about our industry. It's like people literally wake up and call themselves audio engineers. They wake yeah. up and say, I'm a mixer. Like, you know, you don't do that about a doctor. You don't do that about being a, a, a plumber or anything else. There's certain training that you have to go through, certain, right. you know, standards that you have to meet before you can receive that title. We right. don't have that. Anybody with GarageBand now or, or BandLab on their phone, now you're 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 the next engineer and you booking $15 an hour sessions in your dorm room, you know? Yeah, exactly. There's nothing against that, but you know, no, to, listen, don't knock the hustle, the but, but yeah, it hurts the industry. It hurts yeah. the industry really bad. So listen, if, if there's a, a a union or something that needs to come about, like I think yeah. so, you I know, so. just like uh, music that we need protection, yep. you know, and, 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 yeah. and we need some type of <laughs> like, Things are a little bit everywhere, like you said. We need healthcare, you know, <laughs> you know like now, standard stuff. We need insurance, you know. Yeah, yeah. We exactly. need a uh, we need a retirement plan, you know. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of engineers, and and I think about this stuff all the time because I talk to so many engineers that have done amazing projects, and they just are not living the life they should be. Right? They're not being compensated the way that they should be. That I feel, I'm like, yo, you you didn't did that and this and that, and I'm like man, you should be way more paid than this. You know what I mean? And so like, that also gets me thinking about uh, opportunities for uh, audio engineers and music makers to make money, like all the ancillary money, like how, what, and I see that you, you are pretty good at doing that yourself, right? You, you have a, a water company that you are invested in, right? You mm -hmm. own a, your own studio. And you kind of yeah. talk a little bit more about that process of like picking up those extra, you know, doing things around uh, music industry. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, you don't want to, you want to be able to have uh, money coming from different areas. You don't want to put everything just like dependent on it. Like, I don't want everything just coming in from my music career, you know? So yeah. the water company was something It's just like investments, you know, as I gotten older and more educated, um, you know, investing in things that you truly believe in is really key, you know, to, to, to long-term, you know, financial success. So, for me, that's why I made a decision to to put money behind this company that is. Can we a, see um, what's the name of that company? Shout it out. Let's uh, go ahead and see uh, the yes, bottle. Definitely, it's uh, No Days Off Water. Okay. It's uh, premium water. Um, it's a friend of mine out here in Miami. He started this company. Um, he's actually my old trainer. He's a gym guy. Okay. Um, he owns a gym out here. So then he started the water company, and so you know I believe in him. He's had a lot of success in in what he does with the fitness world. And when he started this water, I, I, I wasn't even thinking about being an investor. It just, it was at the studio a few times and I would drink it. And I'm like, man, this water is crazy. Like, what is <laughs> this? You know? And so I started to like, he started, you know, he was like, Oh, it's like this process with reverse osmosis. And, mm -hmm. you know, we put in the, you know, it's alkaline and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. after maybe a few months, like, I remember I went away, I, I was, I went out of Florida for like a month. I was in Texas or something. And I, and I wanted the water and I couldn't find the water. Mm. So when I got back, I'm like, Hey, there's something about this water. I need this water. And, and, and I want to, and I want to be part of this water because I believe in this. So, um, but yeah. And then, you know, the studio is always, that's a, that's a no brainer. You know, it's like, you want to build something that you are able to work in and, you know, if money can be made from it, great. But like I built dream asylum, not with, a business, you know, for a business in mind, because it was more of like a, like an office, a place for me to work a studio. Yep. Um, but of course, through the 10 years that we've opened, we've had so many artists come through here. And, you know, of course, there's, there's a, there's billing involved. So the studio does make money. But, you know, um, that wasn't the sole purpose of it when we first built it. So like okay. I said, like, in the, in the in the next few weeks when I make the announcement, it's definitely going to be where it's just book. You know, you can log on to the website and just book the rooms. Nice. So, uh, yeah. Can't wait to come down to MIA and check it out. <laughs> you know, yo, that's dope. Yo, so I, I'm gonna ask one last question before we get into like some Q and A, and then sure. I know you have a session that you want to uh, show us as well. Um, mm -hmm. My question is like, with with the impact that you've made in the industry thus far you know um and and i hate to bring like harp on this but obviously you know there again 
there's there's a, a small section of our community who are like females, right? Um, but beyond that, but also including that and thinking that in your mind, are there any um, conversations that you feel like should be had more that, that we're not talking about enough? A great question. Um, I mean, honestly, it, for me, the the conversations always go down to not putting the em like what I said earlier, not putting the emphasis so much, right, on 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 gender, right. and just put the, the the emphasis on the job, right? Like I think if we can just get out of, um, you know, just always having to underline like what it like who it is, and you know. It, at the end of the day, like I think every woman seeks out to want to be a producer, or a writer, or engineer because that's what they love. That's what's in their heart. So you know, grant them you know that that passage to 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 seek their dream without making them feel so spotlighted because they're a woman doing it. You know, and I just think like let's just focus on the the craft at hand and and just knock it out the park, right? Like we're all in this together, man, woman. Um, whatever it is that you identify, you know what I mean? But like, yep. um, it's, it's just something that I feel like we should just focus more on the job than, than, than who we are, or what we are. Okay. Understood. Right on. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the wavy seals elite for any questions. If you got a question, just, uh, pop your hand up in the air and wave them like you just don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. We gonna get to you. Anybody got any questions or were we so thorough? Oh, Big Ben has a question. Come on down. <laughs> hey, Lago. Hi. Um, you next. The the question I had was kind of like, have you had any mixes that you've done in the box that you consider maybe better than the hybrid style? Or do you feel like strictly working in the hybrid style is where you get your best work that comes out? No, I, I, I love, I love working either or, um, it just happens that like, I, I like to play around a lot in the studio with what I have. Like I have the tools, like I have a console, I have hardware. So I like to sometimes like, depending on the record, if I just like a lot of tracks, I'm like, you know what, let me bring it out on the board, you know, like in, in some way. Um, but I've done mixes in the, in the, in the box I don't know. Sometimes I'm just so like, I, like sometimes I'd be like, I'd be knocking out in the box mixes so fast that I can't believe it. Yeah. I'd be like, man, and they'd be, they're great. But I'm, I'm sometimes like, I don't know. Like I get a little like, this is too easy. So yeah. I want to, I want to complicate my life a little bit and be, yeah. and that just be on the, you know, like I want to feel things like I'm clicking, clicking, clicking away. Sometimes it's like, it's, I don't know. It's yeah. a little too like, it's just too easy. <laughs> Do you, do you also, I know you say you don't master, do you ever find yourself in situations with the clients where you like, I have to master this, or they they want the master right then, or, or something similar? Um, do you feel like, have you ever had to I, master something? I always let my clients know I am not a mastering engineer. I leave that to a mastering engineer. That is not my world. That is not my, my place. I don't pretend to be it just so I can get an extra dollar or two. I could if I wanted to. But all I would probably do is slap an L2 on it and call it a day. I ain't even going to lie. That's not my world. Like, I don't even pretend for it to be, like, it's just, that's just not what I do. You know, like, I, I love working on multi-tracks. And once I get that mixed down to sound what it's supposed to sound, I, I leave it off to the expert. My expertise is in mixing, recording, and I don't pretend otherwise. <laughs> like, that's it. And then with that, so you leave about what, like a couple of dB headroom and, and send it off and that's it. Yeah, see, okay, so that 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 part can get tricky, right? Because like there's certain like clients, um, like especially in hip hop, they want like they'll be like, Oh, send it, send it to the master engineer, but make sure it's loud. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, but I don't wanna leave all the stuff on. So like every once in a while, like I might leave like a little something on just so you know, just so it's it, it kind of has that color and tone to it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, anywhere, definitely have, you have to leave headroom, you know what I mean? So anywhere like minus eight and under some minus eight, minus 13, something like that. Yeah. I don't go as low as like minus 18 where everybody's like, that's where you, I don't know. That's, I think we can kind of play around. I, yeah. I, I kind of break the rules quite a bit. If it feels good and it sounds good and it's not distorting and I know the mastering engineer has enough headroom, I'm sending it. And then I never get it sent back like. Yo, you didn't leave me enough headroom. Like I never get that. So, 
Thank you so much. No problem. Right on. Thank you, Dan. Let's go to B Girl. B Girl got a question. Go okay, so I'm a super fan and I'm so happy you're here with the Wavy Silver League. Um, I have a question about AI. With the advent of AI and what it's doing now and as it refers to mixing and mastering, do you see that it is infringing upon the mix engineer and possibly could take the job of a mix engineer? Or, and if it does, what do you suggest for us to do as to pivot in terms of if AI is doing that? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no problem. And nice to meet you. Um, uh, so AI, very, very touchy subject these days, especially in the, for engineers, especially mixing engineers and mastering. Um, I definitely do see um, not it currently for like the majors, right? But the more the you know, it becomes more, you know, involved and, and, and it gets better and better by day. I do feel like it does, it will threaten the, the mixing engineer's job. I do feel like that. But there's nothing like human touch to a record. Like there's, you, I, I just, I, even though I believe that, it's only because I, people, it's, it's because music is being made at such a rapid pace and nobody wants to pay the money to get things done so they're like well let's give it a let's let's like all right let's put the song out so let's just run it through i don't know uh whatever wavy wayne's mix engine i don't know i'm just using you for it come in soon <laughs> come in right <laughs> right and it's like let's run it through this thing and and we pay what sixty dollars and okay en mixing engineers get paid anywhere from 1500 and up like on a high end 65, 7,500, you know, a song yeah. um, or more, you know, with the high, high people. But yeah. I do think, you know, there will always be a place for human mixing, but I think that's going to, it's going to shrink. It's going to really shrink it down to, the, to, to that, to those chosen 10, 15 mm -hmm. top world engineers mm -hmm. where, you know, like, a Taylor Swift is not going to put her songs through AI, you know, where those, those, those elite artists are, are not going to go that route, but everybody else, all these new signees, you don't think these record labels are going to, they're not going to want to, even on the low end for a mixer yeah. at 1500, they don't want to pay it. Yeah. They don't want to pay it. They don't even want to pay 500 sometimes. Like, oh, like, so as the technology gets better, to the point where it's so transparent, it sounds amazing. I do think it it will threaten the job, and and it's just really going to shrink our pool of 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 mixers over time. Over time, this is not going to over time. Yeah, I feel like the the labels will be some of the biggest investors in that technology. Especially they already are this, though. Right? They already that, are. That's where they can cut some 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 costs. Like thousand percent. Um. I don't want to get the person wrong, but one of the big head honchos of Universal, I, I don't, you know, I, it might be even Lucian. Yeah. Uh, don't quote me. Oh, God, don't quote me on that. But it's one of those guys and that, right. like, they are, have invested in yeah. AI companies, like technology. And for this reason, yeah. they're, they're not trying to pay an artist any real money up front anymore. Yeah. They're not really trying to give you a big recording budget, which is where the mixing money comes in. So... You know, everything is just shrinking, 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 and it's all gonna, you know, it's yeah, it's yeah. very unfortunate. Recording, yeah, recording. I think it's you still got to have somebody do it. I don't see how AI can totally take that over. Yeah, because they're gonna make it to where no matter where you record, they're gonna clean it up. The AI is gonna get rid of the room noise and the all the background noises. And yeah, but you don't think you know working with an artist like I mean, well, yeah, still... having a produce like being produced. Uh, I don't think artists are going to go for that. Like they're not like what they're. The I mean, maybe I, not there's... the big artists for sure. I not mean, the they're going to be produced for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. yeah I, I mean, I was thinking about that earlier when you were talking about um, like running into those issues with can't get Britney back in the studio. I'm like, now there's there's AI that right now that can cut AI those for that. Yeah, that they got an AI that could fill that in. Well, I was AI before AI. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's go to DJ Just One Hundred. You got a question. Uh, yeah, my uh, question is about uh, reference mixing. So 
um, when you are mixing, do you use it? And so, like, do you have like some go to like songs for like the different genres that you uh, you mix? And then um, my second question was, um, just how do you fight like ear fatigue um, when you mix? Yeah, great question. So, with with for the most part, like I have a pretty good ear on on like a lot of different genres of music. Um, you know, I, I, I work in my studio. I used to do a lot more reference mixing when I was traveling, where I was going from different room to different room. And I had to really understand, you know, what was going on in that particular room. So being that I'm in my own studio now, I know my room. And so if I'm familiar with the genre, um, I, I, I don't really need to do so much reference mixing. Um, there are, Except when I there's a lot of like Latin when I do like a lot of believe it or not like in the Latin world like I do some Latin rock stuff that's not music I listen to so a lot of times I do need to kind of reference you know what that is and either if that particular artist has had albums in the past I I just listen to their old you know um, bodies of work or or or, or like minded artists like them just to kind of get an idea um, but that's kind of it and when it comes to ear fatigue. That is, that is so critical. Like you have to be very conscious of, it's so easy for us as, as producers and, and engineers to be sitting at this computer and it be one o'clock at one moment and then all of a sudden it's 4 p.m. and you're like, oh. And you just went three hours nonstop not giving your ear a break. Then when you give your ear a rest and you walk away and you come back after however long, an hour, 30 minutes, whatever, um, you'll be surprised. It's going to sound so different, so you have to be conscious of uh, making sure that you a don't listen too loud. I I don't listen loud when I mix. That's another thing. So I might be able to go a little longer than someone that is just blasting, you know, the the, the monitors at a high level while mixing. So it, the, 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 the two things to keep in mind is how long and how loud you're 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 mixing, and that can you can kind of gauge like you. Your ears will start pumping if you need to rest them. Like your ears will start doing something real funny. You'll start questioning things that you thought was something in a mix. And once that starts happening, it's because you might need to take a take a break. Um, you'll be when you come back to it, you're going you're going to hear it like clear as day that it sounds weird or you know like like it it wasn't what you thought, and that's where you need to make the corrections. So being really conscious, I don't know what you have to do if you have to set a timer. Maybe you set a timer on your phone and say in an hour, like see how, where you're at, you know. But we, as a mixer, we do so much listening and critical, critical listening for hours on end. You got to be really mindful on on the on the volume that you're at. I do not mix loud. I hardly, I never on the mains in my studio ever. Like only if I'm if I'm dealing with like a sub bass or whatever, and I need to really kind of hear what those frequencies are doing along with other things in the, in the music and vocals, but I'm never on the mains. That's like dangerous thing or any clients that want to hear it up loud. Um, I'm always mixing on uh, NS tens or my barefoot 27s, which has all the different um, yeah. uh, settings that I can switch off. So I'm usually on the flat or the cube and the cube is basically like an aura tone. So those are the right on. Thing. Uh, let's go to Nate. Nate has a question. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, hi. Well, it's an honor to hear your journey. A, a pleasure to see you talk. Hey, uh, I was wondering, I have just two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what is your average uh, time that you spend on, uh, you know, uh, an R&B track? And the second question is, uh, have you ever used any other dog uh, then Pro Tools, I know that's probably a bad question to ask in this, in this form. <laughs> You're good, mate, you know. <laughs> no, no, quite, no, no question is a bad question. Um, I'll answer that one because that one's pretty quick. No other DAW. I have attempted to use Logic and uh, Ableton, and my brain just will not uncross from the Pro Tools wiring in there, in my own head. I can't, I don't know what it is. I mean, I've, I, it's, I've been on Pro Tools for over 20 years. So, I mean, my first... I think I was like still in like version four when I first got into the business or like maybe the beginning version of like five, one, like pro tools, 5.1 or something like that. But, um, I I'm a long and, and long time forever, uh, pro tools user. Um, 
And then the other question, I'm so sorry, Nate, what was the other? No, that's okay. Uh, uh, what, what, would, what would be you consider an average time for like oh, mixing yeah. an R&B track? Yeah, so there's no cookie cutter answer to this. Um, I, I think for me, I can, I can maybe mix an R&B record anywhere between five to six hours, seven hours. But I mean, that's not really, that's not, that just depends on what I'm, you know, what, what, what's, there's a lot of elements that, that go into why it only takes five hours versus seven hours or more. Um, whether it's a good recording, um, you know, whether I have to work on the vocals uh, a little more, uh, the, the, the recording aspect is big because sometimes, um, somebody either didn't use a compressor or, you know, didn't know how to use the compressor. So there's a lot of really like hill like uh, dynamics happening and so i have to really try to you know work on you know a lot of gain uh, gain stages and and automation to really kind of even out the vocal it just depends you know um i mean i've mixed a record very quick you know four hours but i would think you know somewhere i would say anywhere between six and seven hours that's good good time for me well, thank, you. thank you thank you I know why it takes me 30 hours. I'm still learning. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. You could ask me this uh, 10 years ago. I'd probably tell that, you. That's like, why I'm here. Hours. <laughs> years ago, it was a different. 10, 15 years ago, it took me 10, 15 hours, two, three days. Yeah, no, listen. You're good. You're on the right track. Pleasure. Thank you. to the client says, yo, what's up with that record? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Just Cause with a question. <laughs> This is just hey, how you doing? Whatever. Good. Um, appreciate it. Um, you definitely gave a lot of wisdom. But my question was in reverence to when you have clients, do they tend to um send in like either a band lab reference or references that they've done through their phone to you, as opposed to like going to a studio and recording directly off of a quality mic? for mixing yeah well if they if i'm if they're calling me to mix it it's already been recorded so they're basically sending me their rough mix their version of the rough mix so it's already been put in some daw and yeah it's already kind of you know whatever for, for what it's worth if they do a good rough mix and they'll say like we like the reference we just want it to be feel better than this you know but it's it's usually like right off of the session they recorded in the studio. It's not it's not like a voice note or something like that. It's already like the full song is what I'm hearing. I don't know if I answered that. Yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah, you answered it pretty well. Okay. <laughs> right on, Just Cause. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Uh, we got another one from Music by Musical. Mixed by Musical. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just had a question on like as far as like with the mix bus, how do you like uh what is your preference? Is like you gain your volume as you're mixing, or is it like you just mix at a certain level and then bring everything up? So when it comes I mean, so when I first open a session and start mixing, uh, more <laughs> nine times, nine point nine times out of ten, I have to bring everything down. Everything, everything is so is recorded super hot these days. Everything is just so loud, um, and so once I bring everything down um, on my mix bus, I I, I have uh, it depends what I'm using. Like sometimes, in in these days, like I might be using the God Particle. I might be using now this new STL tones thing that I started dealing with, um, some or this mix DSP plugin, um, the the limiter four band. It depends, but like I have that on like while I'm mixing, I'm kind of getting my levels as I'm mixing. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not doing everything all at the end. Like I, I, I get, I get a, a good level from the beginning by bringing everything down as I'm mixing, everything is already going through the mix bus with whatever plugin I'm using. And, you know, the, the levels are being kind of adjusted along the way. So by the time I'm done, I'm, I'm already kind of in the pocket. I'm already in the window of where I should be. And, um, yeah, I might have to just make some minor tweaks here and there. 
So, so kind of basically, you're gain staging and then mixing top down. Correct. Yeah. Is that what I'm doing? <laughs> top uh, down. Of, uh, a lot of people are using those terms nowadays. Top yeah, down. I ain't heard that before. I'm and sorry. Uh, up, no. mixing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to. I don't even think I can explain it. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, dope. Yeah, y'all, y'all asked some some really good questions. So thank you everybody that that asked the question there. Oh, we got another question. One more question from Slang. Uh, you um next time give me more on Britney Spears. I did. Yes, yes, yes. I, I love did. that shit. That is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, that was a I record mean, I mixed completely on the SSL at the Hitback. Actually, no, I mixed it at a couple studios. But um, the final, like right before I turned it in, was the the Hit Factory. So yeah, that that record right there was completely mixed on an SSL board. That's why it sounds you can't you did a hell of a job. That's a hard record <laughs> to duplicate to do it all in the box. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of analog um, circuitry going on in that record. It's a fun record to mix. Mm, I bet you it would. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Miss Lago. So I know you have prepared a session that you would like to show us if you want to take okay. the wheel and I oh, sit back. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, God. <laughs> I get scared when I have to share this because I'm don't. i not the best at this. All right. Are we, are we looking at What are we looking at? <laughs> we see you. We see your edit window. Oh, okay. Sweet. All right. So, I mean, just to give you guys a rundown. So this is a record. Oh, I'm getting the pinwheel. Do you all see the pinwheel? Nope. No? Oh. You don't see that pin? You can you can see the edit? Yeah, it just looks like a regular uh, cursor. Um, oh, let's see something. Yeah, I have the pinwheel on my side. Okay. So it's not letting me do anything. You need to, uh, Pro Tools acting up in front of the company. You know how I do. It was working just fine, right, before? You know, hey, you want to do me? I get you in front of all these people, and this is how you do me. That's how Pro Tools do you every time. <laughs> I know. Why, though? Uh, All right. What should I do? It's cool. You can restart. I mean, it's no no big deal. Um, while, while, while that's happening, um, does anyone else have a question for Miss Lago? If you do. I have I one for you. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm like, if you use the Zoom hand raise, then I can see you just because I can't see everybody on my screen. So if you like raising your hand in real life, then I can't see that. All right, but I hear you, Chris. Go ahead, jump in there. Um, well, we just saw your Yukon and Dante menu there. Uh, are you utilizing Dante in that uh, in the studio there? I am because I, I this is my Dolby Atmos room. Oh, that's very cool. I was yeah, notice the speakers behind you. Also, yeah, tables are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is not my regular studio. I this is the studio across the the line. The my studio is literally I can look I can see through it over on the other side. Oh, but um, this yeah, is like my Adobe Atmos room that I work out of, and then this is my partner, um, production partner Danger. This is his room that he works out of, which is why you probably see all the superheroes on top of the on top of the speakers. Like he's like a big, he's like he loves Batman and. <laughs> like all these little figurines and stuff so my room is like if i was in my room you guys would be like oh yeah that's a like I, it's very chic and you know, <laughs> a, 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 you know girls yeah, nice what's little the new stuff. word what's the new word everybody saying on tiktok uh demure demure, <laughs> yeah. demure. five yes. years some of me screaming at a grandma demure right. <laughs> uh, um, ben, you had another question Yes, yeah, it's, it's got it's a quick one. Um, I remember he, like hearing you say, I'm pretty sure like in your earlier days of engineering, you used to compress everything, and then as you kind of went along, you, you're like, I need to to like lay off compression for th- certain things that'd be more dynamic and natural. I was kind of wondering what, and I also heard you say some things about compression night, like it wasn't compressed right. So I was wondering what your approach to compression is when you're uh, getting vocals or a kick drum or whatever the difference may be between those things for you. Yeah, I mean it's 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 really whatever is the what's being like whatever is called like right you you get a feel for what is needed. So my approach to it is, you know, I never I for, when it comes to vocals, vocals need to breathe. Like that's a big thing for me. Like I don't like 
when I hear vocals overly compressed, especially with good, good singers, like it really just takes away from, from their performance. Um, you know, rap is different. Like you might need to open, compress a little more with rap because there's just so much like happening at, in, in such a fast moment. Um, so, you know, I might, I might be, you know, hitting the compressor a little harder on rap vocals when it comes to like the kick drum, it just depends, you know what I mean? Like, it just depends. Like, I, like, you know, on this particular record, can you guys see this? Nope. Yep. Uh, you got to hit share screen again. Oh, shoot. And I love your answer because, um, that is, a uh, uh, uh classic engineer answer if any if you have ever asked an engineer an answer about mixing or recording or something if they don't start it off with it depends then they're lying <laughs> <laughs> yeah no you it, 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 there's it's not a one-size-fits-all type of thing right it's like yeah. you gotta listen one thing about when, when you approach it can you all see the screen now yes yeah okay cool so one thing when you approach a mix like You know, no, let me tell you, like, <laughs> you know, you know who it was, like, Leslie Brathwaite used to yeah. be like, for a long, I think it's like, I only started mixing in the box completely about six years ago. Mm. And then prior to that, he'd be like, because he was one of the begin like, pioneers in mixing in the box, like he was like, you know, like, he made that transition, like, early on. And, and from what I understand. And yeah. so... He'd be like, you mixing in the box yet? You mixing in the box yet? I'm like, nope, nope. And he's like, <laughs> telling you it's a game changer. Like, you, you like, you got to do it. You got to do it. And so he he would tell me this for years. Yeah. And I would just, like, brush him off. Like, no, nah, I, like I like my setup. I like it. I like it. And it wasn't till I did a mix for BJ the Chicago Kid, right? And I did it all on the board. Like, I, it was, like, 60-something channels of a mix, right? Cause it was a lot of music. It was a lot of music yeah. and a lot of vocals too. And so then he'd say, Oh, like he would, he would come back. Like I would keep the mix up on the board and he wouldn't respond with a uh, mix notes for like a few days. So I'm like, yo, I got this mix up on the board. Like, you know, so then it just got complicated. So eventually I got him to approve it. Yeah. Great. Approve. I mixed, I, I printed the stems. Mm -hmm. This man will come back three months later and be like, yo, I want to, I want to, I want to do this. I want to do this. Can, can I tell you, he came back for recalls because he wanted to keep adding more stuff for two years. Oh my goodness. Two years. Yeah. So imagine if this was like 2004 or five, that era where, you know, like, you got to literally pull up the whole room Everything again. up and like, Matt, oh my gosh. Got the recall sheets out. <laughs> yeah, so it was like literally that happening to me and Leslie's voice in my head, like, man, you got it. It's game changer. Like these clients, man. Like, and, and then finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to just go all in the box. So I went all in the box for like a while, like, because I had to acclimate myself to it. Get it. I didn't, it wasn't an easy adjustment for me, you know? Um, I didn't find it easy. I, I feel like working in, in the box, you don't have as much headroom as, as when you're working on a console. So it was like a lot of challenges. And then, you know, once I got, I got the gist of it, I'm like, oh, okay. And then that's when I started kind of like, well, still got the console here so I can still do both. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, but no, that's why I do what I do on the board. And then I print it back in and, and that's it. I go, I do it all for color. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yo, Miss Lago, I just want to yeah. say thank you again. This has been a uh, a whole bank load full of information and knowledge, and of you know, course. inspiration as well to get a look at your 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 career and and your thought processes. So I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, you know, this this really it, it means a lot to us. You know, like you. You literally are somebody that that we look up to. You know, we we've been listening to your your work for years, and I just want to make sure that you know that you appreciate it and taking the time to to do this for the next generation of uh, folks that's coming coming up behind you. You know, we following your footsteps. We appreciate you. Uh, you know, sharing and being so open about things. Absolutely, no, it's totally it's my pleasure, and this was fun. 
I like yeah. this. I love what you've done here. This is a great community. Like, like Thank this you. is a this is really like I this these are my favorite kind of interviews. You know, like sometimes I'd be doing interviews and I'd be like, oh my god, like that was <laughs> rough. But well, this is fun. So good. Well, I hope uh, to have you back again. You know, um, you know, if there's that. anything that you ever want to share, or you know, like we maybe we we just kind of bring you back quarterly or something to to update us on uh, what's going on in the industry. Uh, I wouldn't be mad at that. I'm sure the rest of us. Absolutely. Do. Well, you and Ben, y'all got my contact, so we can make this happen. Thank you, Ben, for reaching out. All right, before we get out here, I got, I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire questions. All right. Just for some little hot takes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So just first thing come to your, to your brain. All right. Favorite doll. Pro Tools. Your go-to plugin. Uh, <laughs> Fat Filter Pro Q3. All right. Analog or digital? Analog. Coffee or tea in the studio? Tea. Tia, I don't drink caffeine. I don't do any coffee. Okay. okay. Never have. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that you can probably yeah, sleep at me. night. <laughs> uh, best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, um, gosh, that's a, geez. Best piece of advice. Um, you know what? Uh, just you got it. You know, that that one that you just thought about it and it was like, no, nah, that's not good enough. It's good enough. What it what was it? <laughs> Don't be afraid to be unique. There you go. Don't be afraid to be unique. Morning or night owl. Morning or not there's a or you're oh, a morning person or a night owl? I'm a morning person. I I I've done my my I've done my hours, okay? I like my sleep now. <laughs> I, I like sleep. So I don't we're, we're having a, 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 a thirty child. ever. You know, huh? you wanna, especially with with having a son, like you want to be able to get him up, yes. get him to school, do your work, and then I be back like, home by the time he's done. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I be too. Um, favorite song you've worked on? Oh, uh, favorite song, probably the way I are. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's one artist that you would love to work with that you haven't yet? <sighs> It's there. I mean, why why am I going blank on this? There's always so many. You know what? It would be. Um, it's not even an artist. It's a group. It's I I I like love this group, but it's uh, Rufus the Soul. Okay. Rufus the Soul. I love them. Like, I'm trying to catch them at the Red Rock Amphitheater in, in Colorado. In the yeah, in Colorado, I guess. Yeah. I'm waiting yeah. for them to announce their next show there so I can go check them out there. It's just their music is so dope to me. Dope. I, I see that in your future coming up. And then I'm going to just have one last question. What yeah. is a studio must have? Oh. Twizzlers. <laughs> I see you get down on this. I love Twizzlers. I mean, <laughs> strictly Twizzlers, or are you an all around candy person? No, um, Twizzlers or Red Vines. I like I like licorice, but not only those. Like I don't like no black licorice. Don't give me no other flavors. Just the basic, <laughs> just the basic ones. Like what is it, strawberry? Yeah, that's it. I don't like no other flavors. Black licorice is like you know that's that's man. Molecule, man. Like how yeah, you eat that? like I don't. It's like talk. I don't even understand it. Like ugh. <laughs> how you eating the black licorice? All right. Yo, Miss Lago, thank you so much again. Um, yeah. You have you you blessed us, so I appreciate your time, your energy, and all of your insights. Thank you so much. Oh my God! Hope no, to have you back again, and we definitely want to invite you to Mix Nick. So I'll keep you posted on that too. Awesome. All right, and if anybody wants to reach out to me, yeah, you guys can that. Find me on uh in, on Instagram, Incredible Lago. Um, my web my personal website is actually not. It's gonna be launched in the next day or two. But when it is, you guys can reach out to me on there too. It's it's just my name, MarcellaArica dot com. Okay. But it, it's not it's, it's it won't go live for like another twenty four hours. Unfortunately. So anything else you want to shout out before we get up out here too? Maybe what what's the any where where, where we can buy your water? Oh man, uh, Amazon dot com right now. Okay. Uh, right now we're, we're yes, Amazon dot com. It's N D O H two O Ultra Premium Water. Please, yes, support. It's a little dog on the front, y'all. You know you can't miss it. N D O H two O Yes, Make sure right there. Follow Incredible Lago on IG and everywhere else. It's at Incredible Lago. I hope I spelled Incredible right. I'm gonna put it in the. 
Yeah, Incredible Lago. Yep, L A G O. Yes. All right. Sorry Reach no. out. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your of evening. Course. Yeah, you too. Bye, everybody. Take care. Peace.